I uh, Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We have a special guest today that we bring in honor of Dr. Tauri, but we'll discuss that in a minute. First, a few comments. Uh, this week, we saw the launching of uh, Louisville Lectures. I don't know if you have seen this. Please go to our website. It is, oh, it, we believe it's the first open access internal medicine education online community in the United States as it relates to internal medicine. Uh, it's part of the international foam ed movement. Uh, Michael Burke and his uh, colleagues in residency program who are outstanding spearheaded this uh, initiative. Uh, Jen Cook served as their uh, leader and uh, supporter and we're very proud of this. Start looking at this, there are already 40 lectures uploaded. We've seen over 1,200 uh, views already from 100 countries. This is without any announcement or anything. Uh, so this is moving and be aware that when you are presenting at either Grand Rounds or uh, to the residents in their Grand Rounds format, uh, they might ask you if you could please uh, be willing to participate in this program, which I think will be quite, quite exciting. Thanks to the residency crew for, for doing this. This is an interesting day. On this day, March 19, back in 1883, was the birth of Everts Graham. And Graham was an American surgeon who was at Barnes at that time who actually performed the first pneumonectomy. He had a colleague who had a tumor until then in 1933 or before. You could have a lobectomy, but you never had a pneumonectomy, and this person ended up having a pneumonectomy and surviving it. And this was the first time that this was done in St. Louis, Missouri. This is also the day of the birth in 1883 of Sir Walter Norman Hayward who won the Nobel Prize in 1937 for chemistry for determining the chemical structure of certain carbohydrates, but also for synthesizing vitamin C, which was the first sort of artificial synthesis of a vitamin that had been done. He actually died and was born on the same day, March 19. But my favorite American psychologist was actually born on this day, Burris Frederick Skinner, B.F. Skinner. He had the Skinner box. Some of you may have read, heard about this or read about this in college. And he had this social engineering kind of theory that we are what we are exposed to. There's no such thing as free will, that we actually behave and, and do things based on what our exposures have been and our experiences. B.F. Skinner. But today is about the bone. So I looked and looked and looked for something about the bone. Okay? So on this day was the, birth, was the death, actually, of Othniel Marsh. Marsh. Othniel Marsh was an American paleontologist. I start smiling right now. He discovered over a thousand fossils. And he had a fight with another great paleontologist of his time, Edward Drinker Cope. And in fact, they, these teams used to fight each other about who would identify the first fossil. They would steal each other's fossils. They would actually have been known to dynamite sites so that the other team could not dig in them. And this was called the Great Bone Wars. I love my job. But seriously, we come here every year to celebrate Beverly Ta Tauri. Dr. Tauri was born in 1915. He was raised in Southern Kentucky. He attended Western Kentucky State College. After that, he went to Vanderbilt University to obtain his medical degree. He was in uniform for three years. In fact, he was in Italy during the war. He returned back, ended up at Massachusetts General Hospital, where he experienced, um, interacted with uh, Dr. Fuller Albright, and therefore his preoccupation with endocrinology for the rest of his career. He also interacted with Robert Williams of the uh, famous textbook. He returned to Vanderbilt after his training to become the first division chief of a newly developed first endocrinology division at that place. And in 1956, we were lucky enough to have recruited him to the University of Louisville, where he became professor and chairman of the Department of Medicine. And he stayed in that position until 1970. When he stepped down, he fell ill and died in 1974. He was considered an outstanding clinician, an excellent bedside teacher. He was a wonderful uh, colleague, and because of all these attributes, his colleagues, peers, and friends developed this lectureship back in 1982. And so every year we bring an outstanding academic endocrinologist to remind us about Dr. Towery and to remind us about what's going on in this field. 
And so I introduce Dr. Winters, who will present our distinguished guest. Thanks, Jesse, and good morning. It's a pleasure to have uh, Dolores Schoback this year as the Beverly Towery Lecturer. <clears throat> Dr. Schoback <clears throat> is Professor in Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco uh, and a research scientist at the San Francisco VA. And she uh, began uh, as a, a medical student at the Johns Hopkins Medical School and then trained in internal medicine at the Johns Hopkins Hospitals. Thereafter, went on to an endocrine fellowship at the Brigham and, Will Will uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, and began her uh, career uh, studying parathyroid hormone, its regulation by calcium, its increase and decrease in various uh, clinical disorders, and its effects on osteoblasts. And uh, doctor, uh, after fellowship, Dr. Schoback went to uh, the University of California in San Francisco, where she's risen through the ranks to professor and has published over 80 peer-reviewed papers uh, and 50 chapters in her field. Based on her research, she was elected to the American Society for Clinical Investigation. She's been the associate editor of the Journal of Clinical of Endocrinology and Metabolism and is co-editor of the textbook Greenspan's Basic and Clinical Endocrinology. She's been an editorial board member of many uh, fine uh, journals. She's very active in the American Society of Bone and Mineral Metabolism and the Endocrine Society. Uh, she served on study sections for the NIH and the VA. Uh, and uh, she uh, was elected to the Council of Master Clinicians at the UCSF Department of Medicine and received the class of 2015 Clinical Teaching Award uh, at their school. So she certainly is a scientist, a clinician, and a, a researcher uh, in the tradition of Dr. Towery and certainly a fitting person to join us this year as the Beverly Towery Lecturer. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I got it. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Winters and Dr. Roman. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here today to give this lecture to mark the career and the memory of Dr. Towery, really one of the great professors and teachers at the University of Louisville. I really wish I could have known him because he certainly was a member of uh, our country's greatest generation. And it's, it's just a wonderful opportunity to meet those people if they're still with us. Um, to hear their story and, and to know about their contributions because it was a very special time in our country's history and he was clearly a leader in that generation. And as you've heard, Dr. Towery made many important stops on the way in his education and some of those places I was actually lucky enough to visit um, and train at in my own education and they left very lasting impressions on me. And when I read his bios, I learned that he graduated first in his class at Vanderbilt, which is to me an amazing achievement. And he established, as you've heard, the first division of endocrinology and metabolism there. And that division is still a very outstanding one today. And when I was a medical student, I took a summer-long elective um, in the endocrine division at Vanderbilt. Um, and my experiences there, the people I met, the ideas I heard about, and just the interactions really solidified my desire to become an endocrinologist. So I feel like I, I share a little bit of that excitement that Dr. Towery established there. And as many have uh, already said, Dr. Towery excelled at bedside teaching. And as we know, those skills, what it takes, the demeanor, the deep understanding of physiology and pathophysiology, most of us can never ever get there. And, and he excelled at it, so he's truly a memorable person um, uh, for this institution and really for American medicine. So I'm very honored to have the invitation to come here and speak about him and his memory and his honor. So we're going to talk about metabolic bone disease, osteoporosis, uh, what its current management is, a little bit about that, and some new, some I think very exciting emerging targets for therapy. Two quick disclosures, um, lecture fee from Amgen in the past year, and we will be discussing investig investigational medications that are not FDA approved. So we'll talk about osteoporosis kind of at the tissue level a little bit and at the patient level to start out with to just frame the discussion a little bit. Talk about the current approaches to therapies, a little bit about the controversies and the limitations of those therapies, and then what's emerging now and some new and I think very exciting targets that may 
uh, from bone biology that may really inform the way we treat this condition in the future. So let's frame this discussion this morning in terms of a patient, and this is one of my own patients, who is a 68-year-old, as you can see, Caucasian female, works still as a freelance editor, and was referred in actually for a third opinion. And that's often common in this condition because there's so much controversy uh, out there. She was a healthy woman really pretty much her entire life, but she battled depression pretty much her entire life and has received a series of medications uh, for treating this depression, which at that point was pretty well controlled. She had a, a regular menstrual cycles all her life, had used some oral contraceptives, and underwent menopause at the average age for, for that, 50, no significant symptomatology at the time, and never took any hormone uh, therapy of any kind. She did smoke um, uh, for many, many years, but it wasn't very much, half a pack per day, and came down to a pack per week until about six months prior. So about a 50-year smoking history, definitely a bit of a risk. Um, and she drank maybe one to one and a half bottles of wine per week. Uh, all the way through her adult life till her late 60s. So a little bit of alcohol intake. She was a daily walker, and uh, her diet was very minimal in terms of dairy intake. Family history, important because at this point it gives us our only insight into the genetic background. But So a sister with osteopenia, a mother with scoliosis, but no known history of fractures in anybody. Medications, Lexapro, you can see here, calcium every day and vitamin D every day. So things looked okay. She's doing prevention, right? On exam, some mild scoliosis, no blueness of her sclerae to suggest osteogenesis imperfecta, for example, no cushionoid features, really nothing. Um, I, I neglected to mention, uh, she did state in her history that she felt she'd lost about two inches in height. Five feet eight was what she thought her adult height was. And we measured her at five, six and, and a quarter. And there you can see her weight. So just I want you to think about her as we go through, um, uh, as we go through these remarks. So she came with two bone mineral densities for this uh, second opinion. And you can see lumbar spine over here. She was a T-score negative 2.8 in 2012. In 2013, 17 months later, negative 2.9 at the spine. So she dropped a little bit, but that's not greater than the least significant change of the measurement. So you can't necessarily say the spine had dropped but you see the numbers. Total hip and femoral neck, you can see here, negative 1.8, and then 17 months later, negative 2.3. Here at the femoral neck, negative 2.1, uh, negative 2.5. So six and a half and 9% changes over that period of time at the uh, sites in the hip. So what would you recommend? I just want to take a quick survey of the audience. What would you recommend at this time? Would you recommend pharmacologic therapy for her? Or do you feel continuing calcium and vitamin D and the daily walking is good enough? How many would recommend pharmacologic therapy at this point in time? I'm seeing about 40%. There's a lot of identity. How many would just continue walking and vitamin D and calcium? A few of you. Okay. So I guess the majority and many are not voting. So, Anyways, I'm getting, I'm getting the view here. So let's just think about this patient. And this is a pretty common presentation for osteoporosis in an endocrine practice. So at the tissue level, at the bone level, these are sort of well-known images in the osteoporosis field. And this is scanning, uh, scanning of trabecular bone in a normal uh, woman. And here's the postmenopausal osteoporotic bone. You can see the thinning of the trabeculae, the moth-eaten appearance, the microfractures that occur, and just all the open space in the trabecular bone. And so osteoporosis is this generalized skeletal disorder with compromised bone strength predisposing to the increased risk of fracture. And strength is really a composite of both what we see at the level of bone density, what we see in the DEXA scan, and what the quality of that bone is. And so we can measure the density, uh, but we can't really measure quality. And so you don't get any idea from the DEXA of what's going on at the tissue level. But studies like this tell us that the tissue is quite abnormal in osteoporotic bone. So that's what the bone is like. This is what osteoporosis is like in terms of the clinical outcome, which is the fractures. And I like this figure because, well, for one, fractures we know are common. And over time, with age, they take their toll on the patient. And this over here is sort of the age of, the, age of a postmenopausal woman, for example. 
And what you see over here is kind of a qualitative scale for morbidity or reduced quality of life. And so when the Collie's fracture occurs in the 50s, you know, there's a reduced quality of life briefly, and people come back to their baseline. As the vertebral fractures start to occur over the succeeding decades, women and, and men who sustain them really don't get back to their quality of life as they recover from that fracture. And then finally, this final insult here of the hip fracture, the patient has a marked deterioration in quality of life and increase in morbidity, and they don't come back. They really never gain that independence and that quality of life that they had prior to the hip fracture. So it's an accumulation of uh, insults, if you will, to functioning uh, uh, independently. And, and, and that's clearly well described, but in addition, hip fractures really have a very significant effect on survival. And what these data show us is that here's the expected survival in the general population. Women are in the dotted line and men are in the solid line at the age at which a hip fracture will occur. So this is a control population. And you can see that for women, the five-year survival after the age of, of uh, when a woman would sustain a hip fracture is about 70%. So even though they're elderly, their survival is, is really quite reasonable over five years. You can see for men, it's, it's a bit lower uh, down here, probably at about uh, 60%. So that's the, because men sustain their hip fractures at, at later age. Now, if you're a woman who's had a hip fracture, you can see that mortality uh, right here. You're probably down at about 40% at five years um, in terms of the pro probability of surviving. And for men, it's much lower, probably 20 to 25 percent. So very significant effects on survival if you sustain that hip fracture, in addition to morbidity that if you survive. So we've got effective therapies, and there is difficulty in, in convincing patients to take them for, for a variety of reasons, but we definitely have effective therapies to prevent fractures. And I think one way to think about them, and I think will be helpful in understanding what we'll talk about in this lecture, is to, is to step into the bone remodeling cycle and look at it in a little bit of detail. It's a good way to think about disease, and it's a good way to think about therapies and how we monitor therapies. So what bone remodeling is, is what goes on at the cellular level in, in normal and osteoporotic bone. And it really starts with activation of the osteoclast precursor to come to a place in the bone and start resorbing that bone. And we don't understand all the signals. Maybe it's micro damage, maybe it's fractures, maybe it's alterations in loading on the bone. But the osteoclasts come into this place in bone and dig out a resorption cavity. And that's a, that process takes about two to three weeks. So that's activation of remodeling at a specific site in the bone. They undergo apoptosis, and then in come osteoblast precursors, these little blue cells, and they line this naked resorption pit, and they begin to form new bone and to mineralize it. And that process takes two to three months. And then in steady state, when you're young and healthy and no disease present, resorption and formation are tightly coupled, they're equal. And what happened, in, what, what you started out with in the resting state, you end up with at the end of this remodeling cycle. And about in, in the adult, about 10% of the bone at any point in time is being remodeled. So it's an active process that's ongoing in our bodies all the time. Uh, and it just repairs bone as a tissue and it takes care of micro damage and so forth. But in, in disease, for example, in menopause, and menopause isn't really a disease, but it's a significant physiologic alteration, you get increased resorption, the osteoclasts dig deeper pits, they live longer, and you have an imbalance between resorption and formation can't keep up. In, at the other end of the spectrum, in, in elderly patients, resorption is normal, the levels are normal, but formation is reduced. So you see remodeling helps us to think about how bone disease really occurs, and then how treatments work, because you'll see in a moment they act on these different cells and different portions of their remodeling cycle. And this time scale tells us that anything we're going to measure in the bone really is going to have to have a very long time frame. So these are the therapies that are FDA approved for the treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis. And all these different X's tell us how effective they are in placebo-controlled trials in terms of reducing fractures. And you can see we've got plenty of effective therapies. 
And these four in the middle are the bisphosphonates, and probably you'd argue these are you know, the most effective uh, across the board as a class of drugs for reducing osteoporotic fractures. How do they work? It's fairly straightforward. We know a fair amount about this. They bind to the bone matrix. They get internalized into the, uh, into the mature osteoclast sitting on that uh, piece of bone matrix when it comes in to remodel the bone. They then get re um, released into the uh, cytosol of the cell, and then they interfere with protein prenylation. And the key proteins are these DPP binding proteins that are involved in the formation of the ruffled border, this very important structure here that allows the osteoclast to do that chewing up of the bone. And that prevents new bone resorption. And so these osteoclasts stop working because they can't form a ruffled border. Denosumab on that list of agents that's effective at preventing fractures is another anti-resorptive agent. Uh, we use it a fair amount in endocrinology, but I know it's not used so much, at least in our hospital, by internal medicine. So just a, just a few words about what it is. It is a fully human monoclonal antibody, the rank ligand. And this is the class of monoclonals that it belongs to. And it's very high affinity, very high selectivity for rank ligand. So you always want something targeted that's very selective and high affinity and so forth. So what does it do? So this is osteoplastogenesis, this little cartoon here with all these molecules on here. And these are the different steps from the osteoclast precursor to the you know, more mature mononuclear osteoclast to the multinucleated osteoclast, and finally to that polarized, ruffled border, bone-resorbing osteoclast at the end of differentiation. Well, rank ligand, and you can see it right here, it's one of these key molecules, interacts with rank, and that's its receptor, on, the, on each one of the cells in this lineage. And the interaction between those two molecules are what allows all of these steps to take place in osteoclastogenesis, and it allows for the osteoclast to actually resorb the bone. So very powerful um, you know, molecular biology that led to a very important pathway to target in drug development. So every step is blocked with um, denosumab, the antibody to rank ligand. It's high affinity, uh, high selectivity, and you can block osteoclastogenesis very potently with this molecule. Now, one good thing is it does have a long half-life, this antibody. So it allows you to give a treatment like this infrequently, like every six months for osteoporosis. And so far, patients have not formed neutralizing antibodies to this therapy, so highly effective and highly targeted to the osteoclast. Well, just to contrast these two anti-resorptives, your bisphosphonates are on your, on your left and denosumab is over here on your right. And you can see that the bisphosphonates accumulate in the environment near osteoclast activity, and they, they have a very long half-life in the bone. So that is one important, very critical difference between these two anti-resorptive agents. And denosumab, <clears throat> working on the interaction between rank and rank ligand, has a very different effect on the osteoclast, and basically the osteoclast leaves the bone surface. So those are some differences in the way these drugs interact with bone resistivity. Let's turn now to teriparatide, or PTH1 to 34, which is currently the only anabolic agent that we've got for the treatment of osteoporosis. So the, what I've been talking about are anti-resorptive therapies. So now we have something that's working on the anabolic side of the bone remodeling cycle. And this cartoon just illustrates uh, for us some of the complicated, unfortunately, way that PTH interacts with um, cells in the bone marrow, but this is how we think this uh, 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 drug works uh, in osteoporosis. So where it starts is way over here on your left uh, with the mesenchymal stem cell uh, in the bone marrow. And PTH will increase the commitment of those stem cells through the Wnt pathway away from the chondrogenic and the adipogenic lineage, and that's through stimulating the activity of the Wnt pathway. These cells proliferate, they get committed to becoming osteoblasts over here, and then uh, they, their differentiation to even the more ter uh, late osteoblasts is enhanced. And then at that stage, PTH stimulates mineralization and new bone formation by that cell. So active on the osteoblast lineage. And then over here is an osteocyte. You probably haven't 
thought about that cell in a really long time, but PTH has important effects on that cell by decreasing the production of a two proteins, at least, that we think are important, one named sclerostin and the other DKK1. So it's acting here on the osteoblast and here uh, on the osteocyte to alter the production of those two proteins, and we'll talk about them uh, a little bit more in a moment. So that's the kind of anabolic actions, if you will, of PTH. And many of these, as you can see the word Wnt all the way through here, many of these are mediated through the Wnt pathway, and I'll mention that pathway in a moment. The PTH also has, it's a double-edged sword, it also has some catabolic actions, and you see that later. So here, when it acts on the early osteoblast and in the bone marrow, on bone marrow stromal cells, it increases the production of rank ligand, which will then recruit those osteoclasts into differentiation to ultimately become mature osteoclasts. So it is a double-edged sword, if you will. And it gives us, because of that, because it's both anabolic and catabolic, it gives us only a short time frame for um, getting new bone built with PTH. And we call that an anabolic window, if you will. And so what you've seen there is that early osteoblastic action, and you can measure it with bone formation markers, occurs very early and is very rapid and significant. So you get this anabolic window which is followed up by increased bone resorption. So this is sort of the time frame, that one to two year time frame in which PTH can stimulate anabolic activity in the skeleton. And it's because of its specific mechanism of action on uh, cells in the bone microenvironment. So let's come back to my patient, the 68 year old woman, long history of depression, if you remember, some alcohol intake, smoking, and that reported history of losing two inches in her height. Well, nobody's exactly clear what you should do in terms of a workup for um, postmenopausal women that you're evaluating for osteoporosis, but we did do a limited uh, laboratory workup, and I think you can appreciate she had normal um, screening laboratory tests, pretty much everything, including a, a good 25-hydroxyvitamin D level. We screened her for celiac disease, couldn't pick up anything. Her parathyroid hormone level was normal. One thing we did find was that she did have an elevated urinary calcium. When I took her off supplements and measured it, and she did actually have an elevated urinary calcium. We commonly find that in uh, patients with osteoporosis, but that was really all I uncovered in my, in my workup of her. And so I thought about what more I might need to do. And about a year ago, about this time, about a year ago, the National Osteoporosis Foundation brought out some new guidelines on, on workup and evaluation and treatment of patients with osteoporosis or osteopenia. And, and they did emphasize considering doing vertebral imaging. And I bring this up because I, I had gone through these guidelines and, and thought about just doing vertebral imaging in this patient. And so what their recommendations I thought worth reviewing with you uh, are shown here. So age is a consideration here. So women over the age of 70 and men over the age of 80, if they have a T-score that's even in the osteopenic range, they felt one should consider doing x-rays looking for deformities or even fractures. If women are between 65 and 70 and men between 70 and 80, if the T-score is below negative 1.5 at really any of the sites, and of course, as you recall from the DEXAs, she was low at all three sites. And then in addition, if there are risk factors, if the patient has had a low trauma fracture as an adult over the age of 50, if there's historical height loss, and she gave me the history of two inches of height loss, so she'd fall into you know, all of these categories, or prospective height loss, and ideally, patients should have their height measured at least once a year or at least every two years in general, in general practice. So if you, if you pick up a height loss that you can document, um, consider vertebral imaging. If they're taking or have recently taken long-term glucocorticoids to look for silent fractures, if you don't have a DEXA available or you can't do it for a variety of reasons, you may do vertebral imaging. And some would say if you're stopping therapy in someone who was treated for osteoporosis and, and, and knowing what their um, spine looks like would influence whether you'd continue therapy. So these are just some of the recommendations. But at any rate, so we went on to go ahead and do a vertebral imaging in her, and we got some surprising results. So 
a forced diffuse generalized osteopenia you'd expect with her T-score, and, and you like to see the radiologist pick that up. But she additionally had multi-level anterior vertebral body wedging at the T-spine, so early compression deformities and compression fractures. And she, in fact, had a severe osteoporotic fracture of over 50% at L3, which was completely unknown to the patient and certainly completely unknown to me. So at that point, I would say her diagnosis was postmenopausal osteoporosis. She made it by T-score for sure, and she has now this uh, silent fracture. Exacerbation, or risk factors, smoking, alcohol, perhaps that long, long history of antidepressant use based on epidemiologic studies, and maybe a con uh, contribution to that idiopathic uh, hypercalcuria that she had. So I went ahead and calculated a FRAX score on her, and her 10-year risk of a major fracture was 21%, and of a hip fracture, 4.8%. And our thresholds in the U.S. for considering pharmacologic therapy are 20% for the, ma the four major and 3% for the hip fracture. So she certainly would trigger consideration even on the basis of both of those FRAX scores, in addition to her T-score and her, her um, fracture. So then we reviewed the therapeutic options that she had, and those are, these are the same ones we looked at a few minutes ago, sort of the nine FDA-approved therapies listed here that we've talked a little bit about. She rejected all of the bisphosphonates, pretty much. She, she was a journalist. She read a lot. She'd read all the stories about uh, atypical femoral fractures. She was worried about the jawbone problem, et cetera, so not interested in any bisphosphonates. She did not you know, feel that she could take on the responsibility of doing a daily injection, and that's the way Terry Paratide is given. So we were left with uh, denosumab as a possibility for her, the rank ligand uh, monoclonal antibody. And thankfully, we have a lot of options. So if you're going to use this, I thought it was worth spending one slide at least on some things to think about if you're prescribing denosumab. If the patient has hypocalcemia, that's a contraindication or something certain, certainly to be very careful about. Uh, it's a powerful drug. We give six months of the uh, treatment in one injection. So it, you've got a lot of medication going into the patient. If they're vitamin D deficient, that needs to be corrected before you would use this medication. The prescribing information recommends this amount of vitamin D and calcium, so at least that amount. You don't need to dose adjust in chronic kidney disease. It's very, you know, it's very helpful not to have to do anything different in patients with some chronic kidney disease. But if the clearance is below 30, the risk for hypocalcemia is, very, is substantial. And so patients need to be depleted with vitamin D, given calcium, and really told to be careful um, not only about their supplements but also about the possibility of hypocalcemia. And it's now really recommended that if you're giving this to anybody with significant CKD or on dialysis, that the, the calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium need to be carefully monitored because hypocalcemia has been reported and can be serious and has led to hospitalization in some patients. And it can stimulate, because it's such a potent antiresorptive, you can really see dramatic increases in TTH uh, in these patients. So just some considerations if this uh, becomes a medication you start to use more in your practice. And as I've already said, you're giving six months of treatment in one uh, injection. Well, what additional information do we have about this? This is a relatively new medication, very targeted to a, um, a molecule that, that, you know, is new in, in, in sort of our drug armamentarium. Well, we've got six years of data now, and we'll look at that uh, very quickly. But what it is is a three-year extension of the initial three-year registration trial. And so what they did in this extension study was take patients who'd been on placebo for three years. You need to do a placebo trial to get a drug registered for osteoporosis in the U.S. When they took the placebo patients and they put them on active therapy, and then those that were on active therapy, they continued them in that extension. Um, and so um, uh, we'll look at the And they collected fracture data, which is really unusual to have a six-year fracture data. And just to remind you, in the initial trial that came out in the New England Journal, they had about a 70% reduction in new vertebral fractures over three years, so highly statistically significant. 40% reduction in hip fractures, again, statistically significant. And 20% in non-vertebral fractures. So this was the basis for the approval of this medication. 
So in this um, extension study, and what you're looking at over here are the patients that received the denosumab for six years, and over here are the crossover patients, the placebo. But well, let's look at the long-term study. So after six years in the extension study, the reduction in new vertebral fractures was very comparable, three, down to 3.5%, very comparable to what happened in the first three years. So efficacy in terms of vertebral fractures is maintained with six years of therapy. When they looked at non-vertebral fractures, you can see the rate was about 6.5% here um, and, uh, in the first three years, a modest reduction, and 3.8% here in, the, in years four to six. So for non-vertebral fractures, fracture reduction efficacy was maintained for six years. Over here in the patients who were crossed over um, and just three years of therapy, comparable rates of vertebral fractures um, as in the initial trial and uh, comparable rates and non-vertebral fractures after three years. So sustained fracture protection efficacy. So that's important. We don't have a lot of long-term data in a field like this. And so that, I think, is very useful long-term data. Well, what about safety? Safety is an incredibly important signal in treating a, a silent disease that uh, we're trying to prevent an event from occurring. So in terms of adverse events, they were overall similar to or lower than in the initial three-year trial. What were we worried about? This, is, like I said, is a new target, and it's an immunologic target. So they're worried about cancer and infections as the big ticket items in terms of adverse events. And what these numbers are is just to tell you the three versus six years and the events per 100 subject years. So in the first three years for cancer, 1.8 versus 1.9, no difference. For infections, 29.3 events per 100 subject years versus 23.4. So we're not seeing an, a signal in terms of those events increasing with three versus six years of therapy. Okay? And then what about those atypical fractures? This is a very potent anti-resorptive. <clears throat> they did see one mid-shaft femoral fracture and one subtrochanteric fracture in years four to six, so with that longer term uh, uh, exposure. But neither of them met all of the criteria that have now been established for an atypical fracture, and they healed fine. So didn't seem to see an increase in the rate of those things. What about the bone, uh, jawbone problem? So they did see four, um, uh, and there were thousands of patients here, so four uh, oral um, adverse events that were consistent with osteonecrosis of the jaw, and uh, they were seen after the 11th and the 12th doses, and all of the lesions healed. So pretty good in terms of safety there. Um, and then one other interesting thing that's, that has come out of uh, this area is that skin, skin infections made, are one of the infections that people have been concerned about. They did see more cases of eczema, uh, but not of cellulitis or of the infection erysipelas. So not severe germinologic problems. So very, I think very careful due diligence in terms of safety. And we've got six years of data now um, uh, with this compound. So, so there's been one of the controversies um, regarding the field of osteoporosis and its therapies is how long do you treat? And so the FDA, so putting denosumab aside, most of us use a lot more bisphosphonates than denosumab. And so how long do we treat patients with osteoporosis with, with those drugs? And I think most people still follow this FDA analysis that came out about three years, three years ago now looking at kind of a comparison of the uh, bisphosphonates across the board in the registration trials and then in the extension studies. And so what they did to do this analysis, which again guides a lot of our therapeutic decisions, was they combined all the fractures. Everything that was collected, they combined it and just said, the percentage of patients who have a fracture. And, and uh, <clears throat> then they looked at alendronate, residronate, and zolendronic acid. And uh, these are the numbers, so you don't have, the, a lot of these extension studies, the number of patients gets to be pretty small. So you're looking at less than 3,000 patients that are guiding what we do, and there's very, very few men in here. This is just about all postmenopausal women, just in case you're trying to extrapolate into treating your male patients. But at any rate, with alendronate, they felt that the percentage of patients that were improved really was in the first four years. In the extension study, they didn't feel 
by their analysis up to 10 years really showed on, you know, ongoing benefit. In terms of risidronate in the first five years, these little red stars indicate where the FDA felt that this was convincing data to continue uh, for that duration of therapy. And for zolindronic acid, they, they felt that the first three years were the most effective. Although you could look here and say, you know, maybe there was more, there was efficacy up to six years. So the three to five year treatment duration comes from this analysis uh, completely. And it's all post hoc, and it's all non pre planned, et cetera, et cetera. So th this is where that, that comes from. And, and that was driven very strongly and importantly by safety. Well, at that same time, uh, coming out of um, a big study that was done with alendronate for five versus 10 years of therapy, the extension of a trial called FIT uh, gave us these data. Um, and, and what they looked at here was the number needed to treat to prevent a vertebral fracture. And they analyzed the first five years of therapy versus a full 10 years of therapy. And so if you are, uh, and this was all postmenopausal women, if you're a uh, postmenopausal woman enrolled in FIT uh, and you had a prevalent vertebral fracture, like the patient I presented to you, and you had a femoral neck T-score below negative 2.5, 17, uh, a number needed to treat is 17, which is considered a favorable number needed to treat to prevent a subsequent vertebral fracture in the, five, the, in the additional five to 10 years of therapy. If you had a femoral neck T-score um, between 2.5 and uh, negative 2, same number needed to treat. So that they are, they are suggesting that if you are a higher risk patient with a lower femoral neck T-score at the end of five years of treatment and you have a prevalent fracture, perhaps continuing for 10 years of therapy will prevent another vertebral fracture. These are the, what are considered the favorable numbers needed to treat. And if you had no prevalent fracture, just a femoral neck T-score, at the end of five years of treatment that's below negative 2.5, a fairly favorable 24 number needed to treat. So this is just a way to use all the data that we've got to at least try to risk stratify a little bit better the most high-risk patients. Um, and this came out sort of side by side with that FDA analysis. Um, so just trying to help us pick out people that it might be higher risk and might benefit from therapy. So with that sort of little bit of highlight of the co current controversies and current therapies, I want to turn in my last section to some new emerging therapies um, that I think will really change the way we approach this condition in the future. So this was an interesting paper that came out last year in the New England Journal of Medicine on a medication that um, is called romazozumab, uh, which is a monoclonal antibody against sclerostin. And these are phase, this is a phase two study. So I've mentioned sclerostin in that complicated cartoon about PTH action in the bone microenvironment. Um, but there's been a lot of interest in, in this protein. And so what sclerostin is, this is a cartoon that shows you these red cells are the osteocytes buried deep in the bone, which are mechanosensors and also almost endocrine cells buried in the bone. But at any rate, they make this protein called sclerostin. And what sclerostin does is inhibit all of the different steps in the differentiation of the osteoblast through that lineage we talked about, the commitment, the proliferation, the mineralization, the new bone formation, and so forth. So it's a natural inhibitor, if you will, of the Wnt pathway that blocks bone formation and osteoblastogenesis. And it's made in the bone. And bone is one of the very few tissues that makes this protein. So a target, a molecular target for it to be good and to be, and to be um, useful therapeutically, it has to be localized, right? So this is, a, this is suggested, uh, suggested as a very good target. And so the idea here would be to develop a monoclonal antibody that can inhibit the inhibitor. So that's the sort of thinking behind what's going on here. And this is the simplest and I think one of the best diagrams of wind signaling to just show you what's going on. Wnt is a ligand and it's present in all kinds of places. So, and, and there are many, many th members of the Wnt family. It interacts with these two receptors, LRP5 and or 6, and this protein called frizzled. It's a G protein coupled receptor. And a whole bunch of signaling events take place. We won't get into them. But beta-catenin, very important transcription factor, 
when wind signaling is stimulated, that gets stabilized. It then translocates to the nucleus, and if you're an osteoblast, that turns on osteoblastogenesis and bone formation. It's a very powerful pathway in the bone and certainly in many, many other tissues. Well, as I said, sclerostin is one of those negative regulators of the wind pathway. So if there are high levels of sclerostin, this pathway gets dampened down and new bone formation doesn't take place. So this is a very powerful pathway for stimulating new bone formation. So now when we're looking at targets, we go straight to preclinical models and think about what they can teach us about possibly using uh, one of these targets in, in therapeutics. And so, so sclerostin knockout mice were quickly made and they have high bone mass. Well, that sounds good. Is it strong? And the answer is yes. So you can take a mouse bone and you can break it and see how it resists um, breaking and so forth. So the high bone mass and good bone strength, good bone quality. And then they took anti-sclerostin antibodies in, in, in mostly rat models, and they found that they could block immobilization-induced bone loss. That's a good, good thing. They can improve fracture healing when you make a fracture in an animal. And the strength of that healed bone is good. The strength is good. And you can also take an animal model and do an ovariectomy and take the animal way into the menopause for this animal and look at what these antibodies do. And they can almost rebuild the skeleton. So very powerful pathway, kind of as predicted from a lot of the basic science, but here's, you know, the preclinical models that convince you about that. And then you can look at genetic models, if you will, of human disease. And this is a very, thankfully, a very rare disease, but it's called sclerosteosis. Um, and in patients with sclerosteosis, both of their sclerostin genes carry mutations. Rare disease, so they carry mutations. And then um, people have looked at the carriers, where there's just one mutant allele. So other family members that don't have the disease but carry the one mutant allele. And so what we're looking at here are skull x-rays. And this is a child with sclerosteosis. Over here is the adult. And here is the healthy carrier. And so the child has pretty thick bone. Look at the density of the bone. The adult, this is you know, dramatic increased bone mass. And and these people do have problems when there's both sclerostin genes mutated. But here's the healthy carrier. So increased bone mass at the skull, which you can see by the x-ray. And then when they did DEXAs on, on these carriers, their T-scores are a couple standard deviations above normal, but not anywhere near what you'd see when both sclerostin genes are mutated. And here, here are hand films from a patient with sclerosteosis. So we know that the carriers, if you will, have higher bone mass but are not, have no bone disease per se and no other, uh, other disease per se. So we've got the preclinical models and we've got the genetic model, if you will. And so this study with romazosumab, the monoclonal antibody against sclerostin, this is a phase two study, so small numbers, 400 patients. And this was an eight arm, eight group study and it was a 12 month study. The women in this study were moderately osteopenic or frankly osteoporotic. And they either received monthly or quarterly injections of the monoclonal antibody. And this was directly compared to placebo or alendronate or teriparatide. And the primary endpoint was spine bone density at 12 months. And this is just the eight arms of the different uh, stud, uh, uh, in, this, in this particular study. So just show you one figure from the results from this study. And these are the bone density responses to the anti-sclerostin antibody here on your left, the lumbar spine, over here on your right, uh, the total hip. And this green line is the highest dose of the monthly monoclonal antibody. And you can see literally in 12 months, there's a 12% increase in spine bone density. You, you might see that with alendronate, for example, after five years of therapy, and probably not even, even that much. And uh, the blue is alendronate, and the sort of gold color is teriparatide. So almost twice as efficacious as teriparatide and perhaps three times as efficacious, at least in 12 months, as, uh, as alendronate. So very potent, very potent at increasing uh, spine bone density. Over here is the total hip, about 4% uh, at one year. And you can see teriparatide, not, not as much activity at the hip, and alendronate about half of that activity.
effects are very potent, at least in terms of improving bone density. And since this was a phase two study, not powered for fractures or anything, uh, these are the data that have taken, um, taken this medication into a phase three study, which is now underway. But what about adverse events? Again, a brand new target, something we are you know, excited about, but we've got to um, make sure that there's no safety uh, issues. What they saw were injection site reactions in the patients receiving the antibody, um, more of those versus the placebo, and they were generally mild and didn't lead to any reason to discontinue the medication. Serious adverse events, you can see they're roughly balanced, uh, most in the placebo, in fact, uh, across this, and 10% uh, in the romazosumab groups. And these were the uh, serious adverse events. You can see them here. None of them were thought to be related to targeting this molecule or the treatment itself. So safety looked okay, at least in, in 12 months. And as I said, phase three studies are, are in progress right now, so we should have results over the next uh, couple of years, hopefully, maybe even faster, but it's coming. So what other new therapy? I think that the one that's kind of next um, in terms of coming to the clinic is targeting Cathepsin K. And, and that's with a cathepsin K inhibitor. And this is the name of the compound, odanacatib. What is cathepsin K? You probably don't remember this from your histology or your biochemistry. It's quite an obscure uh, uh, enzyme. But at any rate, this is a, just a cartoon of the osteoclast when it's sitting down on the bone, getting ready to resorb the bone. And cathepsin K is an enzyme, a cysteine protease, that's secreted into that resorption pit. So it's a marker in the osteoclast differentiation, but here's where it gets, um, it, it has its action. And it is absolutely rate limiting for bone resorption. So a very key enzyme and, and very important target in bone resorption. And it itself breaks down collagen, that's its job. So this, uh, this um, uh, odanacatib is a blocker a competitive blocker of that enzyme. And so, it, so here's the target, and so how, how does it work? Does it, in fact, improve bone density? And we've got results from uh, phase two studies, again, small studies, phase two, not powered for fractures, uh, but here are the bone density responses. 12% at five years at the spine, at the total hip, eight and a half, 9.8, 11% at the other sites in the hip, so very powerful effects on bone density. So first, at least the first criteria is fulfilled. And these are interesting because they're kind of gradually going up over time. It's not a rapid increase and then stabilization. So there, there may be some ongoing sort of gradual effects on bone mass. And again, a new target, so important for thinking about what might be different. So what we think is that in the classic antiresorptives, like the bisphosphonates and denosumab that we've talked quite a bit about, you get uh, a dampening of resorption, and formation follows that, so you shut down the whole remodeling cycle. So that's kind of a classic antiresorptive, suppressing osteo, uh, osteoclastic activity first, and then suppressing osteoblastic activity kind of as a secondary thing. But we think with this compound, we're calling it an uncoupling antiresorptive, because it's blocking very specifically activity of this enzyme here in the resorption pit. So you're blocking resorption, but the cell is otherwise okay. And maybe that cell is still able to do other things in the bone microenvironment, like signal back to the osteoblast and crosstalk with other cells in the bone microenvironment. So we're calling it an uncoupling antiresorptive because the other cells are left intact to do their job. And maybe that's why we're seeing ongoing increases in, in new bone uh, formation on those bone density responses. And when you look at bone histomorphometry, you don't see a suppression of bone formation. So there's data to suggest that this idea it might, be, might be right at any rate. So maybe a new mechanism of action, maybe a unique mechanism of action. We're not sure, but exciting. So what do we have in terms of fractures? And so this study was presented just a few months ago at a, one of the bone conferences uh, on the use of this medication in a placebo-controlled trial of 16,000 women with the outcome being osteoporotic fractures. And it's given once a week. Um, uh, it was compared to placebo for four years, and it met all of the primary endpoints that were outlined for the study. 
50% reduction in new or worsening vertebral fractures, almost 50% reduction in hip fractures, a 23% reduction in clinical uh, non-vertebral fractures, and 70% reduction in clinical vertebral fractures. So those were the four key endpoints, and all of them were met. All of this, these data are statistically, you know, significantly better than placebo. Now, new target, what about safety? Uh, so they did see, because there is some of this enzyme in the skin, they did see some morphia, uh, sort of a thickening of the skin uh, lesions in 12 patients on this medication versus three in placebo. So something to think about in terms of safety. And they did see five, over the four years, five uh, atypical femoral fractures versus none in the placebo. No differences in osteonecrosis, no actual increase in the presence of uh, scleroderma, no infections, no atrial fibrillation, et cetera. But, you know, safety, of course, is really a paramount uh, concern with any new treatment, and this is not FDA approved yet. But I think potentially will be, will come to the clinic and something that may be, you know, very, very helpful in our treatment or in this area. So just to conclude, I think what, what I've tried to do is to kind of start with the tissue and look at the definition of osteoporosis and, and what it's done to bone as a tissue, talk a little bit about the human impact of fractures on quality of life and morbidity and mortality. And we think this is only going to get wor more significant as the population ages and as cultures become more Western-like in their lifestyles across the world. Uh, we've looked at current therapies. They're, they're effective at preventing fractures, but really the uh, potential for adverse events dampens the ability of patients to be excited about uh, receiving these treatments. And in the last part, I hope I've conveyed a little bit excite of, the, of the excitement I feel about some of the new therapeutic targets that, that people are working hard on. And I think we will have um, better anabolic agents that we'll be able to use in, in the future and really be able to rebuild the skeleton and some of these, uh, and you've been telling me about them and the patients I've talked to you about, rebuild the skeleton in some of these very severely affected patients. So thank you for having me here and, and thank you for your um, kind attention. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Silver. That was outstanding. Thank you. Um, you mentioned WIMP pathway and how it's important for bone development. And in the fibrosis world, we're worried about WIMP because it promotes fibrosis. Uh, interleukin K can decrease collagen degradation. Which, so all these drugs can always have off-target effects in other right. organs that are different, and therefore your focus on adverse events and how important that is. How do you control these studies now that presumably these are being treated because they qualify for therapy. And so it's unlikely to now be allowed to do placebo anymore. What is the placebo for these studies when these patients need to be treated as a new drug? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and it's something that people wrestle with constantly. <clears throat> a lot of these studies are, are not... So in the U.S., the FDA requires placebo-controlled trials, and they require fractures as an outcome. And so you're stuck. You've got to have... Um, you've got to have, a, number one, a high-risk group because you want to do a three-year three or a four-year study. These studies cost a fortune to do. Um, and so you want the highest-risk patients so that you can demonstrate your statistical significance as fast as possible. So a lot of these studies are, in, are done, to be honest with you, in countries where the standard of care is a bit different. And if you're in the placebo, receiving calcium and vitamin D is better than the standard of care. I'm not saying that this is right, but this is often the case, that many of these studies enroll in countries outside the U.S. to get that placebo group uh, because the, the medical care and even just the supplements are a benefit. Um, a lot of the patients in placebo groups have received prior therapy, so they may not be as treatment naive as they were 20 years ago when we enrolled those studies. So it's, it's a combination of all of those things. And we're hoping that, you know, we'll develop enough sophisticated imaging that you won't require a clinical fracture to be an endpoint. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, yeah. Question. Uh, well, I didn't price it, but <laughs> uh, it is something in the range of um, about $800 an injection. Yeah, as I understand it, every six months, yeah.
I do. Um, so diet, I mean, I, I try to counsel people on having a, a, you know, a robust calcium intake. I mean, we all worry about all of the studies that come, have been coming out about vascular events in patients taking calcium supplements, and is there a signal there that's important for osteoporosis? So I have never seen a study really that says that if you have a robust calcium intake, there's a problem. So that's what I recommend for people. And if they don't um, want to consume it or can't, then I use, you know, supplements. And usually get the calcium to about 1,200 milligrams diet plus supplements. Vitamin D, at least 1,000. Um, and then in terms of exercise, I usually try to get them to do something weight-bearing 30 minutes, five out of seven days a week. So yes, definitely. Very important. Oh, it's, it's, so the question is, um, what do we think about combination or sequential therapy? I think they are very interesting right now. There's no FDA-approved combination or sequential. The FDA, you, you've seen the FDA guidance to us on, on therapies. They feel that, you know, you should stop bisphosphonates after three to five years. And they've been pretty much silent on the use of combinations or sequential. And no one's really tested it in a fracture-based protocol. But I think um, what has come out are some interesting small combination studies. And it does look like um, you would use, if you had a severe osteoporosis case, could use something like periparatide for one to two years and then follow it by anti-resorptive therapy, either with denosumab or um, bisphosphonate. That would be a very logical sequential therapy. Most people are not doing combination therapies because what I've talked about already is pretty expensive. Uh, so usually sequential in that way. But with some of these newer agents, we will need to have an idea about how to combine these um, and, and or how to sequence them and whether you do multiple sequences over time. And so somebody's going to need to design some smart studies to get answers to that. Yeah. Well, certainly if it's 40 years old, you'd certainly like to have that woman be treated uh, from about that time point of the oophorectomy with estrogen. I think I would feel fairly safe about that unless there was a contraindication to estrogen. So I'd use that for the first portion of time and maybe even extend that beyond 50 to, 50 to 55, again, depending on breast cancer risk and vascular resist risk and clot. Um, and sort of all these reanalyses of the Women's Health Initiative make me feel like that time frame is fairly safe unless there's extenuating circumstances. And then beyond that, I would look at what's going on with, I would do a DEXA scan. I'd certainly get a DEXA scan at the beginning, see what my risk profile is for that person. Um, and then you'd need to make the tough decision, say at the age of 55 or between 55 and 60, whether you would use something here, or maybe you would use raloxifene at that point, uh, which is a selective estrogen response modulator, or Duovi, which is the combination of estrogen and, and um, another selective estrogen response modulator. So that's a very specific uh, risk group or patient group, and you'd have to kind of work it out with the patient. In California, I can't sell hormone replacement therapy to anybody, <laughs> but this might be the situation where you could carefully look at the risks of the individual, of the woman and make a decision that way. Thank you, Anne, on this side. Yeah, it's a great question. The question is, uh, you know, what could some of these newer imaging studies that are being applied to the bone tell us or help us with um, the micro MRI or the um, high resolution peripheral QCT. So that is almost like a virtual bone biopsy. You can get all kinds of information about bone microarchitecture here at the radius and you can also get it at the tibia. Right now it's research and the same with, with MRI. Uh, 
I don't think MRI is going to ever become, well, I don't know. But, you know, I don't think it's going to be easily translated into clinical practice because it really requires that you actually image the same trabeculae. So it's okay for research. People can dedicate that kind of time. But I don't know if it'll be translatable into our clinical practice. High resolution CCT might be because the machines are easy to, you know, pretty easy to use. They're expensive, but um, the radiation dose is low and <clears throat> you can get a lot of information. So maybe this will be something that we could certainly use in the future. And people are using it in a limited way in the clinical trials to look at what happens to the microarchitecture. You know, microarchitecture gets destroyed in this disease, but we don't get a handle on it from anything that we uh, can measure clinically. Um, so hesitatingly say maybe we'll have it, uh, but I, it's hard to know because there's a big hurdle with cost and equipment and, and so forth. But they're, they're, that field is developing rapidly. Yeah. One final question. I, you mentioned age, but you didn't discuss much about the process of aging in the bone. What's known about that and how do we address that? Mm, I know it's, it's fascinating because um, you're right, I did gloss over. I mean, we spend a lot of time thinking about the changes that occur in, in the menopause. Uh, you know, the, the milieu, the cytokine milieu changes so dramatically in the menopause, and that has such a strong influence. But at the other end of the spectrum, and it'll be very important, you know, for men um, in the aging process and women as well, uh, the, the oxidative environment changes a lot, and that does, that probably is playing a big role in what goes on. Um, when the osteoblast goes into senescence. So we talked a lot about high resorption at the time of menopause and continuing into the 60s and early 70s in women. But later on then, sort of the marrow environment for making new osteoblasts and generating new stem cells, it isn't, it isn't very good. And some of that may be sort of the accumulation of oxidative stress and oxidative damage. And, and there are a number of people working on that. So the osteoblast undergoes senescence. Um, and it just doesn't work as well later on um, in life. And so that's probably, we're all going to experience that in aging. You know, gender irrelevant, so a very important mechanism. Well, Dr. Kovac, we always want to send back, this is a wonderful presentation, but we want to send people back with something that oh relates my to God. Louisville. So this is the Louisville Slugger. Oh my God. I want you to walk in Dr. Thomas King to chair at UCSF. I can't wait to hand. do this. And say, Dr. Roman asked me to come here with it for you. And I also, uh, you can offer it if he, he ever has a fraction. You could sort of, you know, that sort of <laughs> I thing. wouldn't dare do but that. This is for you as a reminder oh, of this place. Oh, my God. So, Dolores Kovac, 2015 Beverly Tower Lecture, University of Louisville, March 19, 2015. Thank you so much. Oh, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, my God. This is amazing. Thank you. Oh my God.